I learn to make my mind large as the universe is large so that there are room for paradoxes. End quote by Maxine Hong Kingston from her book, The Woman Warrior. Welcome to Know Your Fundamentals. My name is Kelly Berthold, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker that created this accessible and attainable podcast series to provide the need to know what, why, and how foundations of mental wellness. It is first recommended that you listen to episodes in order and then return back to episodes in any order to refresh, practice, and gain deeper insight to support your empowerment. As a reminder, the first season is dedicated to what I believe are the need-to-know foundations of mental wellness and will be labeled as The Fundamentals. Disrupting mental health stigma while keeping the ethics, this podcast is for educational purposes only and in no way clinical advice. Check out our website, mindcastmedia.com, for additional content, resources, and more after this episode. If the title and quote of this episode already sounds like we're trying to put the universe into a nutshell, you're not far from the truth. We as people are mind-bogglingly complicated. Our brains have an average of 100 billion neurons that can have 10,000 or more connections. Suffice it to say, our brains are the most complex objects known in the universe. That's pretty awesome. In the modern world we live in today, we're just starting to climb up a very big proverbial mountain of trying to understand the complexities and power of the brain. But before you start floating away and contemplating, what does it all mean, man? I'm going to grab onto your spacesuit and keep you tethered to me before I lose you. As they ask in the climbing world before starting a climb, on belay? All right. If I've got your attention, say, belay on. In the first part of this episode, we'll be starting to distinguish a difference between you as a person from your physical anatomy, understanding key aspects of your nervous system and how they impact our bodies and behaviors, and understanding the basics of how we can create new habits for ourselves. In the second part of the episode, I'll lead you through a body scan practice and a living life practice that is a fun way to explore the benefits of a long exhale. Great. So here we go. Well, I've got you with me as we prepare for this climb, maneuvering one move at a time. It's good to know that we have some pretty solid understandings of the basics, including that one, we know that we human beings are more alike than we are different, no matter who you are or where you come from. Two, you're not just what you were born with, but you're also what you live and experience. And three, you're capable of change, adaptation, and growth. The brain controls everything that the body does and experiences. Although I'm not going to get too intensely into the science of what I'm trying to describe to you, I want you to be able to reflect on that there is a you. We'll call that your mind. Your mind is the conscious, present, aware part of you that makes intentional decisions and choices. It is how you identify as a person. Another part of you is your biological, physical self. For right now, I'm going to call that your brain. It responds to the basics of what your brain and body need to survive and to function in the world. You are both your mind and your brain. Before we start climbing up the mountain, we need to understand first more about the machine of the brain and biological and physical self. And that takes us to the basics of the human nervous system or the autonomic nervous system. I'm going to be using some automobile analogies and metaphors moving forward in this episode to help paint a picture about these mechanisms. When you know more about how the car works, the less you need a mechanic to work out the kinks and the more you can tend to issues yourself without too much personal judgment and stress. Mechanics of this analogy being our proud members of the healthcare industry that would prefer you feel well than come see them in their offices, as well as, not metaphorically, your actual mechanics. Although I'm using cars in this analogy, Just to be transparent, I don't actually know how to do anything to fix my car myself. 
The autonomic nervous system is composed of the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems. Many of the body's functions work automatically, hence autonomic, like breathing, blood pressure, digestion, and so much more. In this car analogy, automatic means it's the gear your body is biologically, physically, evolutionarily already set to drive in without you having to put a single ounce of conscious awareness or thought into it. Our automatic gear in our body's purpose is set to automatically detect a lot of things, both when we're relaxed and when we're stressed. The parasympathetic nervous system is our relaxed or rest and digest response. It's just cruising along smoothly and we're able to properly digest food. Our heart rate is relaxed and our blood vessels are dilated. We're able to utilize parts of our brain to focus better and our breathing is relaxed. The sympathetic nervous system is our fight or flight reactive response. When we're stressed, very broad term, but we'll talk more specifics about stress in this episode as well as future episodes, some head to toe physiological reactions may include our pupils expanding, our muscles tightening, our body stops digesting food or digests less efficiently, we have fast and or shallow breaths, our heart also beats faster, and our blood vessels constrict. As it pertains to balance, we want to come to terms with the fact that we as humans are both reactive and proactive creatures. We are first and foremost reactive because our body will always care more about surviving than thriving. Surviving is a must. Thriving is a perk. Our autonomic or automatic nervous system is built to shift up a gear to fight or flight or freeze or fight or flight for short, when it perceives threats. Automatic reactivity to a fight or flight response is kind of like a newer car technology to autocorrect when it senses you're going over a yellow line or aren't slowing down enough as you're approaching another car. Now, as we know when it comes to reactive technology, it doesn't always mean it's right or that it's always working the way we want it to. And we'll also cover that in more detail as well in future episodes. When your autopilot shifts into a reactive gear, it's deciding to fight off or ward off a real or possible threat. Accepting our reactivity, for better, worse, and all shades in the middle, is a must if we want to be more proactive in our lives. Part of that acceptance is acknowledging that everyone else on this planet and anything that is an organism on this planet is reactive. Now, what do I mean by reactive? I'm glad you asked. To use a Cambridge definition, you thought I was done with definitions in our first episode, but that was just a warm up. Lucky you! Reactive means responding to some sort of stimulus and then a chemical reaction that happens after that stimulus. Proactive meaning, per the Oxford Dictionary, quote, of a person or policy controlling a situation by making things happen rather than waiting for things to happen and then reacting to them. Why these distinctions are important is that the more we can be aware of and accept the things we don't have control of, like reactive and automatic responses, the more we can focus on the things we do, such as intentional, deliberate choices, actions, and proactive behaviors. You may have noticed this word acceptance being thrown out a bit. What do I really mean by acceptance? Using the dialectical behavioral therapy or DBT perspective here, acceptance in the way I'm using it is accepting the reality of what actually exists. It's not compassion. It's not against change. It's not love. It's not being passive. It's not approval. It's reality, whether we like it or not. Acceptance sometimes is seen as being the same as approval, but never in this podcast will I mean it that way. Acceptance and approval are two very separate things. So we want to think about the autonomic nervous system, our brains and bodies, a little bit like we would think of a vehicle, a coffee maker, air conditioning, a television, artificial intelligence. You get the point. Machines have function with a certain type of input, but it doesn't get it right all the time. Sometimes the systems aren't built for certain types of input, and sometimes the mechanics of the brain system experience wear and tear that can lead to faulty functioning. Notice here, I'm not putting your mind in this mix. You as a person are not faulty. 
Even if your system is struggling to make the right connections at times, or a lot of times, some things like this podcast can help with a little bit of a system update and installation of newer hardware, while strengthening some other good stuff that may help balance the mechanics. Nevertheless, we are a mind in an imperfect body, and that also includes our brains. Now, generally speaking, now this may not apply to you, and that's okay, but trying to take some perspective here. If we stub our toe or get bit by a mosquito and our arm swells up, we don't tell ourselves we have a massive character flaw or we aren't worth loving. Hopefully. We have five sensations of the body. Sight, sound, touch, taste, and feeling. We hear things. We smell things. We feel things very matter-of-factly. But we treat the sensations of our brain, the thoughts and emotions we experience, on a whole other level. We want to attempt to establish relationships with our emotions and thoughts like we do with other sensations. That thought is simply a thought. That emotion of sadness, anger, jealousy, in the most simple terms, is an emotional sensation. The physical sensations I have from that thought or emotion, noticing those sensations and existing with them, like stubbing our toe or getting a mosquito bite, That acknowledgement doesn't make them not painful or itchy, but it actually does tend to make them not as painful or long-lasting or as itchy. Thoughts, emotions, and physical sensations are messengers of information. Sometimes the message gets complicated going down the grapevine, and we'll talk more in detail about emotions within the next few episodes in a lot of detail. But for now, let's try to think of them as sensory information that is like any other sense. Information. And that information itself is also imperfect. So let's talk a little bit about the mind and brain connection now. Our mind is the pet owner. And our brain is, in this analogy, a puppy. I don't remember exactly where I got this from. I wasn't the one who originally came up with it. But it's very helpful in normalizing the patterns of our brain activity without minimizing them, including not blocking, suppressing, or avoiding, or freezing in a situation, or exasperating the experience through amplifying it, catastrophizing through it, writhing in it, fighting in it, a fight or flight response. For those who do not know, puppies are cute mammals of the doggy variety and are not machines. I'll keep that definition short. Okay, back to your brain is like a puppy. Puppies run around. Sometimes they're resting and not much is going on and you just let them go, not paying any other attention. Other times they're running around everywhere, chewing holes in the furniture and oh my gosh, after replacing the entire carpet or how could he possibly pee that much? I just let him out. Once the owner, the mind, notices where the puppy is, whatever he's doing, no matter what the behavior is, You become aware of what the puppy is doing, accept the fact that it happened, whatever it was, it absolutely existed, and then kindly, gently direct the puppy where you want it to go and be next. We don't beat the puppy. We don't scold the puppy. We don't make the situation worse because that would be counterproductive. If our minds treat a part of ourselves, our puppies, our brains, with kindness, awareness, acceptance, and choosing how to proceed in a way that will make the situation better, instead of worse, that puppy will often respond more the way you would like them to faster, more consistently, and more reliably for a longer period of time. With consistency, that puppy also does more of what you want it to do, more easily and automatically, with less effort. Long story short, it's absolutely more effective for the short term while also supporting long-term gains and goals. This puppy training is also a free service. You are welcome. Okay, Kelly, if this is so easy, why do I feel like it's so hard for me? I would venture to say that most people listening to this podcast may have had that question come to mind. Another portion has already learned how to do some things that help, and another portion is still in denial, maybe, that they have a problem. All are welcome here. But that question does bring us to a big glaring issue that we absolutely need to attend to. This is a lot easier said than done for many and most people, and animals, and that included me. The fight, flight, or freeze response gets that name for a reason. Your body wants to literally send in physical and cognitive responses, your own chemical militia, to fight something off, 
to run away as fast as possible or is frozen without being able to respond at all, assuming the mental fetal position. These responses can often be intense reactions that happen in fragments of a moment. If you still feel alone in this, I welcome you to just think about current world affairs and the history of the world as we know it. That's right. We are largely living in reactive and not proactive societies and communities. You'll find reactivity more so than proactivity in business models, economies, governments, climate and human justice. It's not something that we can just write off. We all are reactive mentally and emotionally, and it impacts our behaviors, which impacts our lives. We have to first accept and look at this reactivity in the eye. Say, I want to work more with you rather than against you. And that opens the possibility of regulating through it rather than amplifying it or blocking it, which ends up amplifying it at some point in some other way in the future anyway. Truly, there's no escaping it. We want to accept that our bodies go through a lot of reactive and automatic processes on its own on a molecular, microscopic level down to our DNA. But there's one thing that helps us reconnect to our rest and digest parasympathetic response. Bypassing the nitty gritty details, we will instead focus on the unsung, overlooked hero of what's in our control, the helm of our ship, the reins of our horse, the thing you are most likely an expert in actually already their breath. Much of the day, we may not even think about our breath, but breathing wields a ton of power when it comes to getting our bodies and brains to do what we want them to do versus what it reactively, automatically, even habitually is used to doing. We'll talk more in detail about the breath in episode four and five. For now, let's talk about the purpose in using those three words of reactively, automatically, and habitually, because although they may be similar and happening at or around the same time, they influence each other. Breaking them down first, reactively means an outside stimulus impacts an organism and there's a chemical reaction based on that interaction. That happens no matter what. Automatically meaning your body is said to automatically respond based on that interaction of which you don't have any initial control. It will just happen again, no matter what habitually. Okay, so here's where the opportunity for proactive choice and control lies. Your body is wired to be first and foremost reactive and automatic. We just have to accept this as a part of our humanity. It's the way we are wired and we have capability of being aware of some of our reactive and automatic processes and can regulate or control them by intentionally choosing how we want to proceed. Habits themselves are not entirely automatic or reactive or completely proactive behaviors. They rest in this space in the middle of where they can either be a little bit more on an automatic reactive behavior side with some special hint of conscious awareness, or they can be a mindful proactive behavior with absolute conscious awareness. Habits are behaviors that at some point were initiated and practiced over and over and over again, and that the brain becomes accustomed to doing whatever that behavior is, and now it takes less energy to convince it to do that behavior. We have capabilities and opportunities to change habits we don't necessarily want to keep. And we also have ability to increase habits we do want to practice more of. This is a lot easier to do after we first are aware of and accept initial reactive and automatic processes. A special note that we'll talk about again soon in future episodes is naturally harder to do things that take more effort. I will say that again. It's not a personal flaw that this is hard. It's naturally harder to do things that take more energy and effort, even if we know they're good for us. Just adding that quick tip before we talk about that in more detail in the future. Proactive decision-making is using our minds to be aware of reactions, automatic responses, and even habits as they're surfacing or occurring. Then acknowledging the information the senses are sharing. Oh, hey, thanks thought, thanks emotion, thanks physical sensation, thanks memory. 
Thanks, worry. Seeing them as they are and deciding how we want to proceed. It's us putting our hands on the gear stick and intentionally shifting the transmission of our car, our brains, to manual to drive our behavior to do more of what we wanted to do beyond automatic gears. That decision making can have positive impacts on our short term experiences, increase our presence in what we're going through in the moment. It will positively impact our long term experiences, what we want for ourselves beyond that moment. Okay, so that's a ton of information. So we'll continue in part two after we have a little time to digest and try out our episode three practice. We're going to settle into episode three's practice of body scan. They'll give you an opportunity to observe matter-of-factly sensations of the body, accepting the sensations as they arise, and exploring the information of those senses with a curiosity. Check back out on the website for content, including extended practices, these practices, and other guided practices, as well as resources. As a reminder, practices will always be led and reflected on in the podcast episode. This will be labeled as Episode 3 Practice Body Scan. If at any time any aspect of the experience feels too uncomfortable or overwhelming, please respect your WOT or window of tolerance. If your eyes are closed, Open them and consider a proactive activity that you enjoy that brings comfort that can support returning to your window of tolerance or using the episode one window of tolerance grounding exercises podcast recording. Distraction in the mind wandering is inevitable and natural. The practice isn't attempting necessarily to sustain attention, but is actually the practice of noticing where your mind is, existing with it and then choosing where you want to be in the next moment, over and over and over again. If you're present for half of a moment before you get distracted, that's okay. If you're recognizing you've been distracted for several minutes, that's okay. Just notice where your mind is in that moment, accept it, and direct your attention back again to where you would like it to be. Body scan is adding on to the skills you've already been practicing, and we're just going to sprinkle a little bit more into exploring of focusing, shifting our attention. This body scan meditation is a variation from a body scan meditation found on the Greater Good in Action website through the University of California, Berkeley. The link can be found in the episode notes. It's a wonderful website that is completely free with great resources, and I encourage you to access it if you have the ability. If you're doing any activity currently that requires your attention and concentration, such as, but not limited to, driving anywhere or walking where there may be traffic, please maintain focus on what requires your attention. Although the body scan is recommended to practice when you can dedicate full attention, if you are in a safe setting where you and others will be free from harm, you can sprinkle elements of this practice into a living life practice. Again, A lot of the work that we're doing here is not a one-size-fits-all or a one-single way of practice. It's about incorporating awareness and attention into your day-to-day and strengthening your brain's capacity to be able to be more proactive. I will guide this practice as if individuals are seated, though, and those who are listening are able to sustain full attention without multitasking. But again, do what is right for you in the moments of your life you are listening and trust yourself to navigate the practice in a way that feels beneficial for you. Begin by bringing your attention to your environment. Slowly looking around and noticing that you are safe in this moment. Next, bring your attention inward into your body. You can close your eyes if that's comfortable, which may heighten other senses. You can also choose to maintain a soft gaze with your eyes partially closed, blinking naturally. This gaze may direct your eyes naturally in the direction seeing past your nose. Attempt to keep your eye stations relatively around the same place without moving them if your eyes are going to be open. Now take a few deep, long breaths, allowing your stomach muscles to relax, breathing in air deeply into your belly. 
settling into relaxed breathing, and noticing the sensations of air filling the abdomen in this natural breath. Now, notice your body where you're seated. Feel the chair supporting the body. Feel the floor supporting the chair. Feel yourself grounded on the earth where you are. Taking a moment to shift the attention to noticing your feet on the floor. Noticing the sensations of your feet touching the floor. The weight. The pressure. Noticing any vibrations or pulsing. hot or cool sensations. Guiding the attention now to noticing your legs against the chair. Pressure. Pulsing. Heaviness or lightness. Being curious about other sensations as they arise in the legs. Noticing the sensation. And then letting it go to see what else arises in your awareness around the legs. Gently shifting the attention again. Notice sensations of the back the lower back, the left side, the right side, the middle of the back. The upper back. If you're not able to notice sensations in all areas of the body, That's okay. Bringing your attention here, whether you feel something or you don't. Wherever you notice sensations of the back, just attempting to notice them as they are, accepting them as they exist. Gently breathing into the sensation or lack thereof, whether comfortable or uncomfortable. Just being with it as it is. Next, bring your attention back to the stomach area. If your stomach is tense or tight, can you allow it to soften? Taking a breath here. Noticing any sensations around the stomach area and the abdomen. Just seeing whatever comes up, existing with it as it is, existing with this too, you already are. Bring your awareness now to noticing your hands. Are your hands tense or tight? 
See if you can allow them to soften. Noticing any sensations in the hands and the fingers. Maybe a coolness or a warmth. Pulse, dampness or dryness. Practicing a curiosity. Just seeing it just as it is. If any other thoughts or judgments or distractions come up, gently noticing the mind wandering and then practicing directing your intention back again to the focus of this moment on your hands and a present curiosity of what you notice within those hands. Now shifting the attention to noticing your arms and your shoulders. Allow the mind to notice any sensations or lack of sensations there in the arms and shoulder area. See if you can direct your shoulders to soften in a way that feels comfortable for you. Bring your attention now to noticing sensations of the neck and throat. Allowing them to soften if possible. See if you can invite a sense of relaxation in. Gently notice any shift in posture by relaxing the shoulders and the neck and the throat. And a curiosity of any sensations that arise from these changes in the body. Next, guiding your attention now to the jaw, the cheeks, the eyes and the forehead. Doing your best to allow your face and facial muscles to be soft. Guide your awareness now to noticing the whole body present in this moment. Take a few more breaths here in this full body awareness. Being aware of your whole body as best you can. Recognizing that the mind will shift to different areas of noticing mental sensations of thoughts or emotions, physical sensations. Then using and guiding maybe even your imagination to being aware and present with the whole body. Noticing any discomforts from sitting, any desire to leave it, desire to be somewhere else, to go somewhere else, to mentally, emotionally, or physically experience anything else than what you're experiencing right now. And existing with those discomforts now as they exist. 
They are real. They are happening. They are comfortable or uncomfortable. And you can experience this too. You already are. It doesn't need to go away. You can and are and do experience and exist with all that is comfortable and uncomfortable. But accepting it, breathing into it, see how that changes the relationship with it. An opportunity for something else when it's not resisted. even when you don't want it to exist. And a few more breaths here. Now slowly opening the eyes without focusing on anything in particular. Give yourself a moment to adjust back to the space that you're in and attempt to bring this more attuned awareness to the next moments of your life. Next, getting into our reflection of the practice. What did you notice in your body? What sensations did you feel? Did any emotion or thought accompany the sensation you observed? Were any of those thoughts, judgments about the sensations you felt? What happened next after you observed thoughts or judgments about sensations or your experience? And then what happened? And then what happened? And then what? Keep asking yourself that question, and then what happened? Until you've reached the end of that full experience. There tends to be a number of stages through experience that leads to another one. Is what arose within you permanent or impermanent? Does what arose need further addressing? Is there something else that should be done or could be done from your experiences? How may this way of attending be helpful or useful to you? There's no right or wrong here. And like I say, if this is very new for you, it's normal if you feel uncertain or have a lot of judgments or questions popping up. I encourage you that if you have the ability, keep a log or journal of these experiences to reflect back on. The practice is noticing and being with whatever is there, seeing it, accepting that it exists, and choosing where you want to be in the next moment. Trying to be with yourself in a way that you can notice whether it's comfortable or uncomfortable with a curiosity rather than a judgmentalness 
I shouldn't experience this. Other people don't experience this. Why am I experiencing this? I am experiencing this. I wonder where it's coming from. What can I do about it? How can I help myself? How can I feel better about the situation? How can I solve the problem? We'll talk about these concepts I'm describing in more detail in future episodes. For your living life exercise this episode, there's a music recommendation this week, and the song is Bill Withers' Lovely Day. I recommend looking it up and singing along to it. This is an excellent song to sing and listen to if you're trying to reconnect to that rest and digest response. Very long exhales. Keep practicing noticing your breath, especially noticing how often when you sing, you naturally are exhaling longer than you're inhaling, which makes us feel just great. It's hard for our bodies to be in actual distress when we're singing along to a song that we enjoy. So whether it's Bill Withers' Lovely Day or some other tune you love to belt to, sing a song this week that boosts your mood and regulates your nervous system. Try to do it every day if possible to strengthen your habit of taking a long, nice exhale and breath. It's good for you and your nervous system. That's it for today's episode. To wrap it up, we covered some introduction to understanding some basics of the mind and brain, autonomic nervous system, and by accepting the automatic and reactive processes of our brain and bodies, our minds can focus more on what we want for ourselves and feel more empowered to make those desired habits a reality. In our practice today, we practice an awareness, acceptance, and curiosity of physical sensations through a body scan and discuss the living life experience recommendation of jamming out to some tunes as a fun way to have longer exhales and inhales to teach your body a little bit about how the way we can breathe can regulate our nervous system and brains. A regulated nervous system and brain gives our minds, us, a chance to be more in control. I hope this podcast serves you well, and if you have the means to support, please visit mindcastmedia.com to see ways that you may be able to support the podcast and media content that can continue to spread foundational wellness information across communities nationally and internationally. On mindcastmedia.com, you can connect with us for any other questions, comments, donations, merchandise, resources, premium content, and more. Be a part of the MindCast mission so we can focus more on what matters, the access of fundamental information to everyone. Your financial support can help Know Your Fundamentals become bigger and better. Podcast is one medium, but let's try to get this to as many people as we can possibly reach. See our show notes for info, citations, and resources. You can follow us at Know Your Fundamentals on Facebook, Threads, TikTok, and Instagram, KY Fundamentals on X, and Know Your Fundamentals podcast on YouTube. Our Spotify Know Your Fundamentals playlist with over 15 hours of positive upbeat songs across eras can also be found on the mindcastmedia.com website. You can get this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. YouTube and Spotify platforms have audio video with subtitles available. And don't forget, you're awesome just the way you are. Hope to see you again soon. Take care.